people are surprised when I tell them that I never took a class, I never went to art school. I think of this as a gift, something that's not really teachable, something I didn't learn, something I was given as a gift. It was important that I didn't squander the gift and to make use of it. And absolutely, I have no doubt that depicting Northeastern Indians in this series is what I was put here to do. Good morning, I'm Pam Gilbert. Welcome to Historically Speaking. Today, we are in Grafton, Vermont, visiting Judd Hartman Gallery. Now, in order to conjure up what the Indian of the Northeast looks like, since we're back in the 1600s, 1700s, no photographs. Judd has to require libraries, monasteries to send him books so that he can read, research, and begin to, what does this Indian look like? So for a man who has done, as you'll see, all these sculptures, the creation, the, the research, the time, and especially self-taught, unbelievable. So I want you to meet, and here he is, Judd Hartman. Thank you, Pam. Hi, Judd. Thank you so much for having us well, today. I appreciate the opportunity to welcome you and your audience to my gallery and to see my work. Uh, as Pam mentioned, uh, my primary focus is depicting the woodland tribes of the Northeast. Okay. So this is a subject uh, that had not previously been done in sculpture, as opposed to images of the West that have been done by thousands of people, beginning with Remington and Russell. This subject had been overlooked, and it, for me, has been literally like discovering a whole forgotten world. So this is how uh, bronze sculpture uh, begins. I, the medium I work in is plastiline. Uh, this is an oil-based clay. It has the advantage of not drying out because there's no water in it. And I can get much better detail with this kind of clay. So plastiline is what I use as primary medium. And uh, as we saw earlier, I had done this half life size version of this subject, so this is currently involved in just beginning. Uh, so you can see a little bit how they start out. There's a wire armature that is inside the clay. It's supported by this steel uh, post, which you can hopefully see in the back here. So this steel uh, supports what's in effect a stick figure made out of aluminum wire. And then I build clay up onto that. And then uh, parts of this are done, parts are just not even roughed out yet. So uh, this will have eventually, like the bigger one, a cape that'll cover the whole back of it, which I haven't really started yet. Um, so this is, uh, again, based on that, um, group of four Mohawks that went to London in 1710 on a diplomatic mission uh, to Queen Anne. And the valuable uh, thing about that visit was their portraits were painted, commissioned by Queen Anne. So we have visual representations of what they look like. This guy particularly um, had a tattoo and it, it, this sculpture incorporates the tattoo from that 1710 portrait. It's the single best visual evidence we have of what Iroquois tattoos would have looked like in the 17th century. And uh, if you zoom in close, you can see uh, the face completely covered, uh, the chest, the neck, the forearms, uh, all covered in these tat very elaborate tattoos. Uh, clearly a painful proposition, but very, very dramatic looking. And uh, these Mohawks all uh, were six feet tall or more. Uh, at a time when the average Englishman wasn't even five and a half feet tall. And what will happen is this will go to the foundry, which is in Elliott, Maine, uh, three hours east of here, and there they will make a mold. Uh, it will go through the lost wax method of bronze casting, and I'm over at the foundry quite a lot supervising and working hands-on different aspects of the process. Uh, so by the uh, you know, next season, this will be cast in bronze. So this is how they all begin. This is a rubber mold of the Deer Slayer. The rubber is flexible. 
And in order to keep it rigid, we make this plastic exterior shell to make sure that the shape holds its correct original shape. Sometimes in order to make a proper mold, we need to cut parts of the original clay off and make separate pieces. You can see here that this is the deer head from the deer slayer. Into these rubber molds, we can cast, we will cast the waxes. You can see the red um, on the exterior of the, of the um, mold. And this is how we'll do the next process for wax casting. The rubber mold is the one part that's reusable, so that allows me to make the addition, the certain number of castings I decide to make of each sculpture. From the rubber mold, that first negative is created an intermediate positive, which is in wax. At that point, I work on the wax, make sure it's just the way I want it. Once I approve it, we take the waxes, uh, dip them in two different ingredients. The principle is a little like making fried chicken, but instead of batter and breadcrumbs, it goes into slurry and silica, eight times in each. That is then fired to 1800 degrees. At that point, two things happen. The coating turns into the second negative, which is unrefined china or ceramic shell. The wax is lost out from heat, thus the name lost wax. And in that cavity where the wax used to be in the ceramic mold is where the molten bronze is poured at about 2100 degrees filling the space formerly occupied by the wax. Once that cools, we then chip away the ceramic to get the final bronze. So positive clay, negative rubber, positive wax, negative ceramic, positive bronze. For each one in the addition, we go back to the rubber mold, the one part that's reusable, make a new wax, make a new ceramic to get the next bronze. And that's the basic idea of the lost wax method of bronze casting. It takes about three months to do all of that. All right, so what we're about to do now is weld the uh, bow into the hand, and then eventually we'll put a bowstring out of uh, copper wire onto the bow. So I'm going to help place the bow in the position Josh is then going to weld it. Welding. What Josh is doing now is uh, the beginning of the process of creating the patina of the bronze. So it's about a, you know, a couple steps. It's using chemicals and heat from propane torches. So this is, uh, first coat is a light uh, liver, which basically is a chemical that seeps into the cracks and crevices and, and stays, keeps them kind of dark. Uh, in the cracks and crevices. So the ultimate patina ends up with a nice contrast between the smoother areas and the places where there's more detail. And then eventually, uh, you know, he'll use a torch on this and then eventually we'll use ferric iron compounds uh, to give it uh, the effect I want. It's kind of an old leather, kind of an uneven reddish brown uh, patina. And then the final thing we do is we wax it to protect the patina. So this is one of the last steps in the whole process and then once the patina is completed and we wax then we mount it on a wooden base uh, which has already been drilled out to hold the piece. Felt the bottom and that's all done. It really starts to come to life for me uh, when it's that shiny brass effect of the uh, bronze initially, it, it doesn't appeal to me. Once the color starts coming on, then I really, really starts to look how I envisioned it from the beginning. I love this part of the process, yeah. Think back of when I first began the piece with the armature and then the clay and then all the steps that have come about since then. Yeah, it's pretty satisfying to see it at this point. We've finished the patina. 
Uh, we've got uh, two different kinds of wax on it, which is beeswax, the first coat, and then a paste wax after that. It still has to be buffed out. And before I do that, I'm gonna use some white wax, uh, wax to which probably titanium oxide has been impregnated to create a, an effect of snow down at the base, because this is a winter scene. So we're gonna dab this on. And then finally, after all the steps here at the foundry, and there are many, uh, to get to this finished state, something that will last a long time. I love this medium. And the fact that it will be so long lasting, also the fact that I can create sculptures like this, which would be impossible if I was working in wood or stone or marble. I wouldn't even entertain an idea like this. Okay, so I'd like to know about this statue and you can tell me, and then I have a couple other questions I want to ask you about her. <laughs> yeah, this one, uh, titled Katiri Tekawita. Katiri was a Mohawk woman um, who, in infancy, was scarred with smallpox and was actually the only member of her immediate family to survive. And then later converted to Catholicism, moved to Montreal, Kahnawaga, which is the Mohawk village right outside of Montreal. Uh, died at a very young age of some other European disease at the age of 24 in 1680. Yeah. But a year and a half ago became the first Native American saint in the Catholic Church. Really? Wow. Yeah, Saint Kateri. And Kateri is the Iroquois version of Catherine. I love that name actually, Kateri. But the Jesuits who were with her when she died all reported that the instant she died, the scars vanished and her complexion became pure. That was the beginning of her road to sainthood, ultimately, which finally happened about a year and a half ago. So what I was going to ask you about the women, are they as large as the men were in proportion? Uh, there are some uh, indications that they were. Um, the women are not nearly as well documented in the research material because because they're women. <laughs> well, no, no, actually, I'll tell you a little story about the women. The women were actually very powerful in the native society, oh, yeah. um, yeah. but especially among the Iroquois. Um, but they just weren't in contact with Europeans as much. It was the males who were in contact with Europeans, so they're the ones that are written about, you know, the diplomatic missions and all that. But to give you a little idea about the Iroquois, uh, the Grand Council was made up of 50 uh, mostly older men, elected only by the women and the women had the right to recall. Uh -huh. So if a chief they elected didn't live up to their expectations, he was warned twice to mend his ways. If he hadn't done so the third time, yeah. replaced. Good. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Here, here. So this sculpture, uh, one I did again years ago uh, in slightly over half life size version. And a year, a little over a year ago, I decided to revisit these larger, uh, earlier pieces and do them in a smaller scale. And this was the first of the three. This is titled Susquehannock, uh, based on a written account of Captain John Smith of Jamestown. So this uh, bronze, which I did years ago, is a half-life size version uh, titled King of the Maqua, Maqua being the Dutch word for Mohawk. And this is based in part on a 1710 portrait of this uh, man that went to London uh, on a diplomatic mission with three other Mohawks. Caused a great sensation throughout the whole kingdom. And the reason I'm directing you at this one is because uh, what I've been doing lately is revisiting themes that I had done years before like this one in a half life size and doing them uh, in another interpretation on a smaller scale. So the clay that I'm currently working on is a 21 inch version of this with modifications of course. So I love creating different textures, and I think that absolutely uh, adds to the work. So this one, um, this is the oldest individual in here. His name was Shenandoah. He was an old Oneida Iroquois chief who spoke in Albany in 1752. And on that occasion, he was described as being so old, it was said that the fathers and even the grandfathers of the oldest white men present that day knew him even then as the old wizard of the Oneida. The English estimated he was between 140 and 150. Really? 
That's what they thought. <laughs> and he delivered this very powerful speech at the very end of which he said, I am an ancient hemlock. Winds of many more than a hundred winters have whistled through my branches. I am dead at the top, and the generation to which I belong has run away and left me. Why I alone still live, only the great good spirit knows. Amazing. So every once in a while in the course of my research, uh, this is all anecdotal, but there are references and indications of occasionally these people living to be very, very old, especially if they were lucky enough to avoid European disease. And again, no way of verifying any of this, but I'll give you uh, probably my favorite example was a Jesuit missionary living among the Mohawk in the year 1680 wrote a letter describing the old people in the village, and he wrote a sentence or two about each of them. Uh, one of them, to give you an idea of the rest, he described this way. There is, living in this village, one old woman who is alive to see the fifth generation from her offspring. She was somebody's great, 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 great grandmother. So after describing them all like that, he then concluded the letter with this. But they were all as nothing compared with one old woman who was so old that even all of those oldest people in the village never remembered her as anything but old. <laughs> so I think it's safe to say she was probably pretty old. <laughs> this sculpture titled Garakanti uh, depicts uh, a very significant figure in the 17th century. He was head of the Iroquois Confederacy until his death in the year 1677 at the age of about 100. And arguably, in his lifetime, because of the power of the Iroquois at that time, he is probably the single most powerful individual in all of North America when he was alive. He's considered today to be the greatest American diplomat of the entire 17th century, fluent in French, fluent in English, and literate in French. So brilliant fellow. This is a good example of the intelligent aspect of the Iroquois. Very warlike, but clearly very, very intelligent, very savvy. And uh, to give you a little idea of how he spoke, in 1653, included his first major diplomatic achievement, uh, concluding a treaty of peace with the French governor of Canada, reassuring the French governor on that occasion that our young men will no more make war upon the French. But he allowed they are too warlike, to stay at home for long. And next summer, we invade the country of the Uries. Here, he reassured the French governor all will remain calm, but in that quarter, and he motioned ominously to the west, he said, the earth will tremble and the ground will quake. So this sculpture uh, is uh, the only one in the whole series where I actually had a photograph to work from. Uh, she was very famous in the part of Maine where I live in the summer. And her name was Molly Molasses. She was an old Penobscot Indian woman who posed for this photograph in 1865 when she was 90. And in the Abbey Museum in Bar Harbor, which is focused on the history of Maine Indians, uh, is the original hat, the medallions. There were two of them made out of silver and this photograph. And the photograph uh, was actually, it's called a carte de visite. It was popular in the mid 19th century where you had your image placed on like a large, uh, bigger than a playing card, uh, and you use it as a calling card. So if you stop by somebody's house on a Sunday afternoon and they weren't home, you stuck the card in the door just to let them know you've been by. So some of those card de visite uh, of her have survived, so that's where I got the image. And um, a great face, full of character, uh, but she was very formidable. She was considered a great shaman, had supernatural power so that her white neighbors feared to cross her. And she was described in these terms, that she had a very sharp, keen eye and a peculiar way of blackening her face like a thundercloud when anything displeased her. Her face would change color entirely and her eye would look like thunder and lightning. She knew everything that was going on and was keener than a knife. So at one point, a newspaper reporter from Bangor was interviewing her when she was about 90. And one of the questions he put to her was, why is it that the white people call you Molly Molasses? And she looked at him and replied very simply, but clearly very sarcastically, 
because I so sweet. And so it was okay. Right. So after a few of those quotes, <laughs> then I have this quote following those. This was a guy named Edward Abbey, who I think was from California. He said, the missionaries go forth to Christianize the savages as if they weren't dangerous enough already. <laughs> So we've had quite the morning and oh, afternoon with Mr. Oh, Hartman. Good. <laughs> and we want to thank Chris and Bill. Yeah, come on over here. Okay. Uh, Absolutely. For thank joining you. us Wonderful. today. Oh, it's great. Wonderful. Yeah, it's just beautiful. Thank you very much. Beautiful. Glad you and I want to us. also thank my husband, Art, for his filming. Mm -hmm. And uh, Art's nice director. <laughs> Wonderful. So. Good. Thanks, Pam. We'll be back. Thank you.